My name is Father John Perdue, and I'm the Vocations Director for the Roman Catholic Diocese of Peterborough. There are many people out there who would be surprised that I'm sitting in the seat I am in today as a priest and sharing my vocation story. And uh, I think I might put myself in that category as those who are surprised that I'm here. So I was born and raised in a Catholic family in a small uh, Irish Catholic community called Duro, Ontario, which is just east of the town of Peterborough, where I'm a priest currently. I come, by God's grace, from a very uh, strong Catholic background. Uh, Irish Catholic roots run, run fairly deep, so I was friendly to the faith and uh, we practiced. I served on the altar. In Duro, the community I'm from, the church is an important part of the, the life of the community. So uh, it, was, it was always there, sort of the backdrop in my, my life as a child. Um, and I would say uh, challenges in my faith and, and why my vocation is now a surprise. Uh, these began when I was in grade nine, probably, when I went to high school. Sometimes when I'm telling my story, I sort of jokingly say, at, this is the point where I say, beep, and then I became a priest <laughs> to glaze over a certain aspect of my life. And that's just to say, I, I, I went, I fell off the beaten path. I got into uh, hanging around some friends who weren't good for me, some habits that weren't good for me. I, I lived a lifestyle that was very self-serving, um, that centered around parties and having a good time. Uh, sports were a big part of my life, uh, but faith very much took a back seat. I continued, I did well in school. I continued to, I went to a Catholic high school and I continued to do well. Like I say, sports became a focus. I played a lot of uh, hockey, soccer, and baseball. Hockey being the, the main one, I, 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 ever since I was, well, I guess maybe seven years old. Hockey has been a part of my life, and I played for the Duro Dukes. We won two Ontario Minor Hockey Association championships. During the summer, I tried to stay in good shape so I'd play well when the season came, and we won a, 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 also won a provincial title in softball. I was a softball player as well. So sports were a very big part of uh, my life. I guess, though, when I'm talking about the seeds of a vocation, um, where God was at this point when I'm, when I'm sort of um, partying and playing sports and engrossed with, uh, with hockey, uh, he was still there by way of my family's um, forcing me to continue going to Holy Mass. <laughs> I, I didn't go very willingly at this time in my life, but I, I still continued to go. And so I know that my, uh, my soul was still being nourished by occasional confession, not very often, but... Um, when um, like the school would go or when I was, um, yeah, the, the, the pretty much school confessions would have been it. And then um, hearing the word of God at, at Holy Mass, like I would, I would sit there and listen. Um, and then the prayers of those around me was, was really what was keeping the vocation possible and keeping uh, me from maybe sliding too far at this time. Uh, particularly uh, the prayers of my sister. I have a sister who's a religious. Her name's Sister Mary Catherine Purdue. She's with a community called the Sisters of Our Lady Immaculate. So when I was 16 in grade 10, I, I think that's when she joined, she uh, joined the community. And because of where I was at in my life at that time, I figured my sister has taken religion a little too far and she's gone off the deep end, but there's still hope for the rest of us. <laughs> Little did I know uh, where life would take me, but at the time I, I sort of just thought, um, you know, that, that my sister had gone a little too far with, with her faith. Um, but she was praying for me and continues to pray for me uh, very diligently, uh, daily, uh, particularly through the intercession of St. Joseph. Uh, she's been praying for me. And so her prayers, the prayers of my grandmothers, of my parents, sort of, you know, kept me, uh, like I say, from maybe departing too far from the faith, from a relationship with Jesus Christ and the church. I guess you'd sort of fast forward ahead to um, university. I graduated St. Peter's High School in Peterborough and I went to Trent University, also here in town. I didn't really know what I wanted to do, but I was attracted by English. I love, I love literature. I've always loved reading and by biology, and that's uh, largely due to good biology teachers that uh, made me enjoy it at high school, so I was considering those two fields. 
And so I, I went to Trent University. After my first year, I decided biology was the route I wanted to take. So I, I pursued a joint major in biology and environmental resource science at Trent University in Peterborough. And in the midst of this, um, I continued a sort of self-serving lifestyle and sport-centered, um, friend-centered, relationship-centered, uh, you know, dating a few girls and uh, not God-centered yet. And when I think back on how God was at work in my life and how I ended up here today as a, as a Roman Catholic priest, I would point to a few things. Uh, one was certainly the presence of, of conscience. And that's, you know, I think thanks to my parents and the upbringing that I had that I knew right from wrong. And when I would stop and think critically about some of the habits and ways I was acting in my life, I had a sense that uh, there's a better way to act. Prick of conscience from time to time. Um, awakened in me a sense that something had to change and it wasn't overnight uh, and, I, and I, I sort of fought that change um, personally and there were societal pressures against me changing my way of life but uh, there was there was conscience and there in, in particular again I'd, I'd mentioned the influence of my sister sister Mary Catherine she's in a semi cloistered religious community and so the family ha doesn't have as much contact with her as we might if she was in another community so we spoke to her once a month and I can remember at times my once a month phone call with my sister. Sometimes it would be on a, a Sunday and you know I might not be feeling great. I maybe stayed up too late the night before and I didn't really want to talk. And, um, but here I was on the phone with my sister and it verbally put her life in contrast to my life. I was brought into contact with a life of self-sacrifice, of service of God and others. And it convicted me at times, and I didn't like to admit it to anyone, least of all myself, but I felt convicted that someone I know closely is um, living a much richer and fuller and more meaningful life than I am. Um, so so the, the, certainly that, that's one aspect, sort of the, the sting of conscience and the call to um, conversion was one. Secondly, I'd say my relationship, uh, my, my dating relationships. And uh, to this day, one of the young uh, women that I dated, uh, she still gets bugged like, oh, he had one experience of dating you and now he's a celibate priest and we all know why. <laughs> they tease her uh, a bit about that. It wasn't that, it wasn't that dating was so terrible that I, I had to flee to the priesthood. It, it's hard to articulate, but it's almost quite the contrary. I had very positive experiences of dating and um, and yet when I would think about and envision myself married to this or that uh, young woman, it's hard, like I say, to articulate, but there was a sense that it, it wasn't right for me, that I would have a sense that there was something more I could have done for the kingdom of God. And that is not in any way to say that the married vocation isn't uh, self-sacrificing. Absolutely it is. In the Gospel of Mark 1.16, Jesus encounters his apostles fishing, and he says to them, Come follow me, and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed Jesus. Thank you, Father John, for joining us today. You're welcome, Rani. A pleasure to be here. Thank you. Father, um, to be a priest is such an incredible gift for all of us. And um, it, it takes a certain man, a brave man, really, to lay down his life for others, to save others' lives, really. Can you just um, elaborate on that a bit? Sure, Nadia, yeah. Um, and I'm happy you asked it. Uh, 
I, I think uh, the image of the priest as sort of a, a brave, a sort of manly man is, uh, was a turning point in my own vocation story, like coming to see the priest as a heroic figure and not someone who sort of le leads a comfortable life and goes with the flow, but a man who's willing to uh, lay down his life in service of God and neighbor. That was a pivotal moment in me being actually attracted to the priesthood. Um, before I had ever perceived the priesthood in that way, it wasn't all that attractive to me. So, um, yeah, I, I think absolutely young men need to hear that message, that to be a priest is to be a, a hero. Jesus was a hero. Uh, the priesthood is the love of the heart of Jesus. To be a, a priest is to be configured to him. And who is a greater, more selfless hero than Jesus Christ? Find me that person. There's none. So um, certainly to, to get out there the image of the priest as a man who forsake, forsakes the good of the goods of the world for the sake of the kingdom of God, someone who's willing to put God and others before himself, those are the men we need, and we need them um, badly. And uh, you know, I think, I think some of the challenges to my work, uh, vocations work these days, are um, misconceptions about what it is to be a priest. Mm -hmm. And I think if that true image of the priest can be put out there more visibly on display, it will be attractive. It, it speaks to the desire of a young man's heart to, to be a hero, to lay down his life for others. It, it spoke to my heart and it will speak to other hearts as well. Right, that's incredible, Father. Yeah. I could see that. Um, so I could see that there's, I mean, you went from fisheries biologist right. to um, God calling you to the priesthood. Right. So what are some of these great joys that you have, like, as becoming, you know, a priest and now, again, a vocations director as well? Yes, sure, sure. Well, of course, I would point to the sacramental ministry of the priest, to, to hold Jesus in your hands, to mediate God to humans and to bring the prayers and petitions of the congregation to God. What a gift. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, it's humbling, it's humbling. The moments, uh, you know, you uh, at times look into the chalice at the moment of the consecration and sort of think about what other men have done this down through the years before me. In whose footsteps am I following? Oh, there's so many inspiring figures, uh, St. Philip Neri, St. Alphonsus Liguri, St. John Vianney, St. Augustine, St. Ambrose, they're all, they all looked into this chalice and said the words that I'm saying back to Jesus, you know, and uh, so to, to think about in whose place I'm standing is a baffling kind of humbling mystery. So absolutely, the offering of, of the holy sacrifice of the Mass is uh, a profound joy of priestly ministry and something that I've not fully understood yet, nor will I ever fully understand, but allow to wash over me in my priestly ministry. Um, so, so absolutely the, sac the, the sacrifice of the Mass. And then uh, healing souls and confession, I would point there as an as a absolute joy of priestly ministry to, to be able to forgive people their sins, to have people uh, unload sometimes years of burden that they've been carrying and looking to be freed from and have not been able to find freedom from and to mediate God's mercy to them. Um, again, what a, what a gift. So uh, absolutely healing souls in confession and offering the holy sacrifice of the Mass are at the pinnacle of, of priestly ministry. So that's where I would absolutely begin and end. The Mass is the source and the summit. It's a good place to begin and to end. Um, and then, of course, um, uh, counseling people, teaching about the faith, uh, seeing minds open when they, they think of something in a, in a way that maybe they haven't thought of it before, or when their hearts are struck by some aspect of our faith that they've never been introduced to before. Um, these are points of joy. And then in vocations work, um, I guess to encounter generous hearts is very, edifying uh, to see young people who are you know father i want to know what god's will is for my life can you help me you know that, that's humbling and i'm trying my very best to help them hear clearly god's uh plan and, and will and purpose for their lives so to to encounter generous hearts that are seeking the will of god is a joy of vocations ministry 
Beautiful, yeah. beautiful, yeah. and very powerful, Father. Ooh, yes. And, and through all of this, um, through your testimony, you shared about prayer and how important and how pivotal prayer was for yourself in terms of your conversion. You had your sister who's a religious that was praying for you. You had your grandmothers that are praying for yes, you. Yes, I didn't stand a chance. You had no chance, right? <laughs> Especially with grandmas, right? And a sister that's yes. a religious. Yes. Um, but one of the beautiful things is your own life in terms of being prayerful as well, like as a priest, so that I guess maybe that you can give to others as well. Like how important is prayer then for you and for others as well that are discerning. Yes, it's, it's like uh, how important is breathing for our interview here today. <laughs> uh, it couldn't happen without, without breath. Uh, I, I would lose my vocation. Uh, the, the ministry would bear no fruit. Uh, it's, it's absolutely um, pivotal and absolutely uh, carries me uh, forward. Yeah, I, I guess I would point to the blessing of the particular role I'm in right now. I, I run a house of discernment, young men who are considering priestly ministry and want to live here and learn more about what it's all about. So to, to enable them to have a depth of spiritual life, uh, we have daily Eucharistic adoration, uh, Holy Mass every day. We pray the Rosary as a community every day. We pray the Liturgy of the Hours uh, in common. Uh, these kind of structures are a blessing, not just to them, but to me, <laughs> to, uh, to be a part of a, a community that um, lives and breathes in, in prayer is, is a, a real blessing. Um, and also, I'm very edified personally by the number of people in my role as vocations director. I can travel from parish to parish in the Diocese of Peterborough, and the number of people who will see me and say, you know, Father John, I, I've been praying for you, or I, I saw, I have your holy card from the time you were ordained, and to know that I'm being held up by uh, the prayers of the people of God. Right. And all of the people who don't know me by name, but who pray for priests, um, I, I have little doubt that that's the, the thing that's carrying me forward and uh, all priests, you know, is, is the prayers of uh, the saints and, and uh, the people of God, yeah. And that's incredible, especially being in this noisy type of a world where, you know, social media and it's, it's constant noise. So I guess right. to really hear God calling you, like, you know, you have to hear him in the silence, right? So I think that's key of, of being prayerful and when you're discerning the vocation. Absolutely, yes. Yeah, I would say one of the uh, greatest tips I could give to young people discerning their vocations is to spend some time in, in silence, even if it's just a couple minutes a day to start. You know, for a lot of young people, silence is a, is a scary thing because they have none of it. And so to begin with, with even a little amount each day, a few moments of uh, I'm not on my phone, I'm not uh, with others, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just silent. Um, that can be very powerful. And then as one can take a little more, you know, uh, upping it and, and watching what the Lord can do with that space you give him in which to operate. Uh, so absolutely, I, I remember, um, well, different things I've read and watched over the years, but a comparison of uh, a vocation, um, you know, to, to like the growing of a seed, a seed planted in the ground, it grows in silence, like, you know, a lot of the hours of the day are, are quiet, you know, at night and, um, you know, a, a vocation grows in silence and it needs that, that, uh, that, those moments of calm and quiet. In my own life, before prayer was integral to my vocational journey, fishing has been around, uh, you, you know, Your made model, reference Vado to that. Pescare, right, right. right. <laughs> okay. Yeah, fishing being, um, place of, of quiet like if I couldn't find a friend to go fishing with I, I like fishing enough that I will go on my own you know and even as a young man I would call around and if everybody was busy well I'd go out and um, it wasn't that I was necessarily praying but I would think and uh, you know you can you can be moving so quickly in today's day and age that you don't think <laughs> so to have that opportunity to to just even think and it opens the mind to the possibility of I suppose, wrestling with bigger questions, like, am I happy with where I'm at? Is my life going in a good direction? Are there things I need to change? I think silence, first in fishing, and then gradually in prayer, and still in fishing, <laughs> has been a part of my own vocational journey. What would you give some advice to men, young men discerning in terms of, like if they were discerning the vocation? The priesthood? The priesthood. Yes, I, I would encourage them to be open, I would also encourage them to read up on what the priesthood is. Don't allow yourself to 
have any kind of misconceptions about what the priesthood is. And so there, oh, there's so many good resources I could point to. Um, you know, I, I don't know if it's helpful to mention a couple, but uh, I love Dom Columba Marmion. Uh, it's called Christ, the Ideal of the Priest uh, by an Irish uh, monk, Dom Columba Marmion. Brilliant expose on what it is to be a priest. That's the first one that comes to mind. There's, there's many other good right. books on, on priestly ministry. John Paul II's Pastores Dabo Vobis, I Will Give You Shepherds, is what that means. I will give you shepherds after my own heart um, from a, a prophecy in the Old Testament. So those are two places. So I guess I'm saying understand what it is you're considering and uh, look to good um, guides to help you understand that. The first and foremost of them being Jesus. Pray, have a spiritual director, make it regularly to uh, confession and devotion to the Eucharist, you know, loving uh, the holy sacrifice of the Mass and time spent in adoration. These are uh, things I would, um, these are the bread and butter of right. uh, discernment. Key things, yeah, sure. absolutely. Don't try to discern apart from, uh, from some of these things. Yeah, yeah. Hope that's helpful. That's great. Yeah. Thank you, Father. Sure. Thank you. To any young man watching this who's considering a vocation to the priesthood, I would leave you with the words that Jesus gave to St. Peter in Luke's Gospel. He told Peter, Duke in Altum, put out into the deep. The priesthood is an adventurous, a beautiful lifestyle, and if God is calling you to it, we need heroic young men to say yes. May God be with you, and may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'm pleased to introduce Shalom World, a new 24-7 dynamic, family-friendly Catholic television channel. This new English language channel is from Shalom Media, a Catholic media ministry that has made great contributions to the church in the past 10 years. I invite you to join me in praying that Shalom World television channel will be a strong voice of the Catholic church in proclaiming the gospel of Christ to our world today. Shalom World, God's own channel.